Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to the sixth and final phase in this ongoing tutorial related to installing operating systems and using virtualization. So I'm going to be demonstrating how to set up and manage virtualization using VMware's ESXi and vSphere hypervisor suite. And this is going to differ quite a bit from the five previous tutorials that we've done, although each of them have certain aspects that are going to play a role in what we do in this tutorial. So just a quick recap, in our previous tutorial to this, in our Phase 5 tutorial, we covered setting up headless virtual box on top of our existing Ubuntu server, and then we used that virtual box software using command line to create various different virtual machine guests with operating systems in inside of that. Now for this tutorial, what we're going to be doing, uh, and I'll just go over a couple of important points that I want to make and then cover these diagrams, which should hopefully clarify everything that I'm going to say, and hopefully it'll make a lot more sense to you. The first thing that I need to point out, though, is that we're going to be starting with a fresh install. And what I mean by that is that whatever is on the hard drive that you install ESXi onto is going to be erased. So make sure that you either back up that data somewhere or use a hard drive that you either don't have anything on or don't really care about what's on it. Number two, ESXi requires a dedicated machine to be reserved as the host only. The host machine cannot be used for or interacted with for normal operation and the host and guest virtual machines on it must be managed from a remote machine using client software. So essentially you're going to need another laptop or another desktop to access this server machine and manipulate it in some way. Now I put a little asterisk here next to the Android and iOS for tablets and phones because I believe they have some third-party software uh, I'm not really sure that VMware makes it themselves, and I'm not really sure how far it goes in terms of functionality. So rather than relying upon this, you might be able to use it later on, but make sure that you have a laptop or a desktop, at least to start with, to um, manipulate and follow with this tutorial guide. And point number three... ESXi provides virtualization at a much lower level than our previous example with VirtualBox did. So with VirtualBox, it required an existing operating system layer below it, and this meant that VirtualBox was more of a software implementation where ESXi hypervisor runs directly over the hardware layer. So it's a hardware abstraction in itself, and it gives us less overhead, better performance, and more direct control. So let me clarify that a little bit using these diagrams. In our previous example with VirtualBox, we had this layout. We had a physical machine, which had the hardware layer. This was the CPU, the memory, the hard drive, all of the various components of the physical computer system. And we installed an operating system to it, as we normally would. In our case, we used Linux uh, Ubuntu server. And then on top of that, we installed an application called VirtualBox in headless mode. And then using that, we created various different virtual machine guests, which could then be used to install operating systems of their own into. And those operating systems and files inside of it would access the actual hardware of the physical machine through all of these various layers. So all of these give us a degree of overhead and um, you're going to lose some performance due to processing cycles and memory in, uh, in between all of the layers here. One of the things that we could still do, however, was to sit down in front of that physical computer to use that keyboard and go ahead and log in using our username to this operating system here and perform some kind of work, install applications, or do whatever we wanted with it. We're going to lose that capability with ESXi, and we'll see that in a second. So with ESXi, uh, I outlined the physical machine here in red. So what we're going to have is, a, is the hardware layer, that's the various components of that physical machine. We're going to be installing the operating system to it. And in this case, we don't have a traditional operating system or VirtualBox as an application. 
it's kind of merged all together into the ESXi hypervisor. So we're just going to be installing that hypervisor directly onto the hardware. That, by um, its functionality, is going to allow us to create various different virtual machine guests, which will have their own operating systems. So again, you lose all of this overhead and gain some performance and a lot more tighter control from hardware layer to each guest in the process. So with this, VirtualBox ultimately relied on what the operating system was allowing it to do. All of this is controlled through one single point um, of access right here. Now, we can't actually sit down in front of this computer and use the keyboard to really do anything useful. That's not to say you can't do anything with it, but we'll see in a minute that you're very limited in what you can actually access with that keyboard once we go ahead and install this. What you need is a separate laptop or desktop using this application that we'll download later called vSphere Client, and that will allow us to log into this machine and set up these various different guests. Now, once these guests have been set up, let's say we put Linux Server in here, we can set up SSH and use an SSH client from any other computer to access this. Same thing, if we had a Windows guest, we could go ahead and set up Remote Desktop and use a RDP, a Remote Desktop client, to access that machine. So, um, the vSphere client isn't the only way we're going to be able to access these guests, but it is the only way to actually access and control the ESXi um, itself, the hypervisor itself. Now, we're going to be using the freeware version of ESXi, and they're, they do sell it as a paid edition, which gives us a lot of different benefits. So really, I'll just touch upon those so that you can see the limitations that we're facing when we use the free version. The free version is not limited really in any way that's going to hinder what we're going to be doing here. Um, the paid version is more targeted towards businesses and the enterprise where you might be managing many different um, ESXi hypervisor physical machines in one go. So if we were to pay for the license version, what we would have access to is something called vCenter. Now, if we had, let's say, a dozen different physical machines and we had ESXi running on each one of those, each of them with their own guests, the way that we're doing this through the vSphere client, we would have to go ahead and log into each one of those dozen machines, these are denoted in orange, one at a time. So 12 different logins and logouts separately from each other to manipulate each of those machines. Now that becomes very tedious, especially with 12, but what happens if you have a data center with maybe a hundred or a few hundred different instances like this? So it's not really scalable. And what you need is something like vCenter, which allows you to view and manipulate each and every one of those or all of them in one go from one centralized location. Another cool aspect of it is what's known as vMotion. And vMotion allows you to, in real time, migrate from one machine or one host to another one. What this requires is another machine in the middle or a network attached storage box that hosts your data store. So if we imagine that we had one server with a guest, let's say this is a Linux server running Apache and this is running our web services, and we have a bunch of users that have logged in and are doing some kind of work on that machine from outside. And now we, as the administrator, have to shut this machine down to do some kind of maintenance on it. What that's going to do to all of our users is force us to either tell them we have to disconnect you or we just go ahead and shut it down and they perceive some kind of downtime or they're disconnected and it impacts their productivity. So rather than doing that, um, traditionally what we would have probably had to do is set up another machine and mirror it and then uh, roll all of those users over to the other one. And of course that's gonna still give you a small window or a small degree of downtime that we don't really want. In many cases you want to avoid that. With vMotion you can avoid it altogether and you'll have zero downtime. 
So the way it works is you have your guest and all of the files are on this data store, which is a separate box on the network. And now you're going to set up another host and another guest that looks and acts just like this one. So it's going to be another instance of Linux server set up basically the same. And you go ahead and point it to the same data store. And so now it has access to the same files. And now using vCenter and vMotion, we're able to push all of the processes, all of the users, all of the connections, everything from this physical machine here over to this other host onto this other guest. And then also give it the same IP address, the same MAC address and whatnot so that our network can immediately just shift all of those connections from this machine directly over to this one in real time at one uh, instance in time so that there's zero downtime. Now all of your users still connect, they still have access to everything the same way, they don't even know that they have been shifted from one physical server to another one. And now you can go ahead and put this in maintenance mode, upgrade it, um, do whatever it is you had to do with it, and then you could actually go ahead and re-migrate back to that machine again in real time. And of course, if something happens in the process, you still have this one up and going. You knew that it was working a minute ago, so you should be able to just roll back to it and either have very limited, if not zero downtime in the process. So all of that is uh, some of the functionality that you would get with the paid version. We're going to miss out on those cool features. Although when you register, I believe you have access to all of these features for 60 days. And then after that, you either have to pay or register your product to continue using it, albeit with the limited uh, freeware license. So... Either way, uh, we'll come back to this in a minute. The first thing you need to do is go ahead and register an account and access the VMware website. So we go to www.vmware.com and you want to go to their products page. And you can see they have a whole bunch of different products that you can access. Some of them are free, some of them are trials, some of them you have to pay for. We're interested in, under free products here, the vSphere hypervisor. Or you can go ahead to all products A to Z and find vSphere hypervisor. Same link. Go to it and click download. And you'll notice you can't really download it until you log in or create an account. So if you create an account, and you're going to want to put in legitimate information here, but I'm just doing this to demonstrate what um, they ask of you. Go ahead and continue. On the next page, they're going to ask you for a valid email address, password, your name, phone number, address, and how many physical servers you plan to use this on. The number is 1 to 999. Uh, pick whatever you want. I think I chose maybe 5 to 7 when I did mine, just in case I decided I wanted to install it on multiple different versions, uh, um, servers rather, agree to their terms, and go ahead and continue. And I believe they'll send you an email with a link to activate your account. And once you do that, you can then log in. So once you log in, you'll eventually get to a page like this where you can access your account and download the ISO. Now there'll be two sections that you're interested in. The license information which will give you a 25 character license key and then your download packages section which will have a number of different options. You want the one that pertains to the VMware vSphere hypervisor 5.1 update 1 at least as of this tutorial date. The first option here is the one we're interested in, which is ESXi 5.1 Update 1 ISO image. We want the ISO image, so we can either download it using their manager, which is some software suite that will allow you to download not only ESXi itself, but other applications or other services that they offer. And 
Alternately, you can use the manual download, which will just open the link in your browser and start downloading it through there. So it doesn't really matter which option you decide to go with. Uh, it may take, um, you know, five or ten minutes to download, so go ahead and do that. Take note of this, although you can always access your account to get this later, you're going to need this at some point in the near future. So just take note of this license key. And once that's all downloaded, you're going to want to burn this either to a CD or a DVD or put it on a bootable USB, which you should be familiar with. You can look back in some of the other tutorials if you haven't followed along. I chose to burn mine to a DVD using DeepBurner. And once you have that bootable disk, you can go ahead and take it to the physical server machine you plan to boot it with. And I just had a little video I put together here. It's pretty poor quality. I recorded it with my cell phone and uh, the settings weren't really set right. So I apologize for that. Um, once you boot up with that disk in there, it should boot from there to this menu. You want to use the ESXi standard installer. Go ahead and press enter on that. It's going to load a whole bunch of um, different modules. So we'll let that run. And then the next screen will pop up. And this might appear at, a, at time to time to um, freeze up or lag. But just let it keep going. Eventually it'll um, do its thing. So let me just skip ahead, and again, I apologize, it's really hard to read this, but basically it's just asking you some information. It's very straightforward. You should be able to follow along with it. Uh, it's going to tell you it wants to install it. It's going to ask um, if you have other files existing on the hard drive, do you want to overwrite it? And this is why I told you to back everything up, because it's going to wipe out whatever's on that hard drive. Uh, it'll ask you to accept their user agreement, so go ahead and do all of that, and it'll start installing. This whole process should take maybe 9 or 10 minutes at most. Now I can jump ahead. So then it will reboot. It asks you to remove the disk from the tray. And now this is essentially the screen that you will see at any point in time when this ESXi hypervisor is running. So this is why I had said you will essentially lose the ability to log in or do any real productive work with this computer. It will only give you this screen and a limited subset of other screens that you can access for things like um, checking logs and changing the keyboard layout and some of the basic networking aspects of this physical computer itself. So this will just continue to load up and then at this screen here it will list uh, your the host name of this machine and the IP address that was issued. So assuming you have the network cable plugged in and it's connected to a router on your network, it should have been assigned an IP address on the private network. In my case, it was issued, it's hard to see, 192.168.1.7. So take note of that. And I'll just play ahead here. You can see down here it says press F2 to access the configuration menus. So once you do that, it's going to ask you for the username and password, in this case the root username and then the password that you would set up when you initially created the ESXi instance here. So once you put that in, it'll come back here for a minute and then bounce you to this page and here you have the limited set of functionality so this is a, the most that you can really do with the keyboard in front of this physical computer anymore so now we want to take that IP address that we had seen on this screen here 
And what we want to do on this machine that we're working on, this is the remote laptop or desktop that you have to access it, you want to type in that address. So 192.168.1.7 in my case. And I'm going to hit enter. And it didn't happen here, but it gave a warning page normally. Um, and it will tell you something that uh, the, uh, the certificate for this page is not um, been verified. So it should look something like, let me see if I can get it to pop up on Firefox. Uh, maybe if I close it and reopen. Okay, this in Firefox is the warning you would get. This connection is untrusted. What should I do? The default is this button here, get me out of here. And this is normal behavior to protect you because we're connecting over HTTPS using SSL to a site that has no security certificate that's been approved. Now this makes sense because you don't have an SSL certificate. So what you would want to do here, and it's perfectly safe to do this, is I understand the risks, go ahead. Now, if this happened to some kind of a public uh, website that you were accessing, you might not want to go ahead and do this. But in this case, you're only connecting to your own server, so it's perfectly safe. So you go ahead, I understand the risks, add the exception, and now confirm security exception. This is for Firefox. Uh, it's a little different in Chrome, but same basic concept. And now you want to go ahead and download the vSphere client from this link here. So once you click that, it's going to go ahead and start downloading this um, exe program here. And once that's all downloaded, you can go ahead and install it inside of Windows. And that will give you a program that looks like this. This is VMware vSphere's client. We double click to open. And now the default username is going to be root, and the password is whatever you set it to be. Okay, now VMware evaluation notice, uh, your evaluation license will expire within 60 days. So you have your 60 day trial period, you can immediately assign a license key to it, or you can go ahead and use some of those advanced features which are going to be cut off after 60 days unless you pay for a full license. And that's pretty expensive, so you either maybe you want to experiment with it, or maybe you want to go ahead and activate it right now, this way you don't get used to things that you're not going to be able to access later on. Either way, in my case, I didn't do it immediately. So once you don't do it from this page, at some point in the next 60 days, you're going to want to go ahead and put that in so that you don't lose access to this in some period. So right here it says evaluation mode, 60 days remaining. And the overview on the left, we have the top level, which is the server itself. We can see a summary, some of the information regarding it virtual machines there are none at this point resource allocation we can see storage memory and cpu information about the overall physical computer we can see some performance metrics um, now configuration is going to be one of the major areas that you want to look at you can see a lot of different information that we can access about the computer through all of this um, if we go down here to the license features under software, we can see the evaluation mode when it expires and all of the features that are available to us at this point. If you want to go ahead at some point before the end of this trial and activate your server license, you go over here. So again, we're under here go to configuration to license features it brings up this screen and then all the way over here you see this little link for edit we want to select that we can see no license key has been added and we're in evaluation mode so we want to assign a new key enter key and what we would put there is this 25 character key code that 
we found under our account through their website. So you put in that key code, you press OK, then you go down here, you press OK, and that would then tell you, um, update to tell you that this doesn't expire ever, but the features are going to be limited down to a smaller subset of all of this. So as I had said before, we have access in the full uh, evaluation mode to the vSphere vMotion, and I believe vCenter agent, as well as all of these other different um, product features that they offer. So you can just check out all of the different aspects of this and there is a lot of different things that we can do with it. Um, under events we can see different events that pertain to the machine itself, permissions, we can set users and groups on it, um, manipulate or get readouts on the processors, the memory, the status, networking, so you can see there's a whole lot of different things that are entailed by this. And you can watch numerous different tutorials um, or read up through their documentation on what each of these things do as you go. But the basic thing you're going to want to use this for, of course, is to start installing guest operating systems. So before we actually can begin doing that, we either need a, an operating system to install burn to a disk or we're going to need to put an ISO image file onto the server so that we can install from it. So what we want to do first is go ahead and click on here and we want to go to our um, data store. So you can go to the summary tab for example and find storage data store, right click and browse the data store or we can go to our configuration and if you click here on storage go to data stores uh, first if you go to devices you can see that there is a single hard drive installed and it tells you it's 390 gig and there's also a CD-ROM drive attached to that machine as well so we want to go to data stores and now you find data store one. Let's go ahead and view some properties about it. Okay, so now let's right click it and go browse. And we can see by default we have this root layer here. Now here's a folder that I created previously. If you go ahead and just create a new folder, and in my case I named it ISOs and then double click to go inside of it and once you're inside that ISOs uh, folder you can click this icon here and if you just hover over it it says upload files to this data store so if we click on that we can go and upload a file or a folder either way if we select one of those options now we're inside of our local machine this is the machine I'm working from this is where the client is running. I can upload any ISO file or any other file for that matter from this computer onto that server. So in this case, Ubuntu 12.04, server AMD, uh, the 64-bit version. If I select OK, it's going to then go ahead and transfer that from this machine onto this computer in the ISOs folder of Data Store 1. Now I can go ahead and actually create a new virtual machine. So to do that, right click on this icon over here, go to new virtual machine. We'll use the basic typical configuration settings, which should be fine for us. And just name it something that's going to pertain to whatever you're going to install on it. If it's going to be your web server, you can name it accordingly. Just give it a, a name that's going to help you know exactly what it's going to do. For demonstration purposes, I'm just going to say um, virtual guest one destination. So where do you want to store the operating system files and everything for it? Again, data store one in my case is the only one I have access to. If I had multiple hard drives, I could set another data store and install it to any of those. 
In this case, I'm going to be making a Linux guest, specifically Ubuntu Linux 64-bit. How many network interface cards do I want to connect? One is fine. The default should be okay. And now this is important. The virtual disk size, the available space is 291 gigabytes. Um, 16 is their default, which is a little low. I would recommend somewhere around 40, uh, probably minimum, if not larger. So I'll just do 40 for now for demonstration purpose. Select finish. And now you can see this plus here and our virtual guest has been created. Well, there's no operating system on it yet. So the first thing we need to do is attach either a disk or the ISO image file. So to do that, let's go ahead and right click on it. And we can see from that menu, we can either power it on, take snapshots, open up a console, which is gonna be helpful for us, edit settings and a number of other things. So let's go to edit settings and you can upgrade how much memory for this one I now have one gigabyte of allocated memory for it one CPU I can give it more virtual sockets multiple cores video card SCSI controller hard disk drives network adapters you name it you can pretty much set it on this client here. So we want CD DVD drive. And right now we have nothing attached to it. We can either use the host device, which is the actual CD ROM drive in that physical machine. We could put a disk into there. So we could put Linux, a bootable Linux CD into the physical drive and attach it using this. Or in our case, in my case at least, I'm going to be using the ISO file that I just uploaded. So I'll go to data store ISO file, browse, we put it on data store one, we put it in ISO's folder, and there it is. So let's go ahead and select OK. Now this is important. What we want to do, and I've been caught a number of times by this, is connect at power on. Otherwise, it will never pop up and you'll get stuck in an endless loop where you go why isn't this booting up just make sure you select that and select OK and now you're ready to start it up so let's go ahead and right click again and power on and now you see a little green triangle here it's actually running but we need to view it in some way so you can either use this icon here to launch a virtual machine console we can right click and go down to open console or we can use this tab over here for console either way they're going to give you a console this one will give you a pop-up window and now after a few minutes uh, hopefully seconds not minutes it should pop up with the standard installer for Ubuntu server so if you take your mouse and hover over this and then just click your mouse should disappear you can go ahead and start installing Ubuntu server the way we normally would. Uh, detect keyboard, no. And we covered this entire process in our previous tutorials a few different times, so this should all be familiar. I'm not really going to go into detail about the different settings for it, but the one thing is that you've now lost your mouse in order to get that back, what you want to do is hold Control and Alt at the same time, and now your mouse has come back. So you can start uh, using it on your system again while this is going, so you can background this process and do whatever you need to do. And just check back here. So I'll just call this uh, new host 2 is fine. Just be sure if you want to access this again, you have to click into it, and now you can go ahead and work with this. Full name of the new user um, is going to be demo for me. Demo. Encrypt it, no.
logical volume management, that's up to you. You can read about the differences between it. Um, we've kind of gone over this before, but uh, I'm going to opt not to use it. And all of that's fine with me. So I'll go over right changes. Yes, that's fine. Now while this is installing, let me just point out that, uh, let me get my mouse back. Over here, this is the IP address of the physical machine that ESXi is running on. Each guest, now this machine only has one ethernet cord plugged into it. That is, I believe by default, going to be allowed to be connected to four separate virtual network cards. So what that means is we'll end up with, each guest will have a separate IP address in the 192.168.1 range. It'll be separate from this, so it'll be accessible over the network um, directly, even though it's all funneling through this same uh, single interface card. And I believe each interface card itself will have access to four separate um, virtual ones. So if you had, let's say, three Ethernet ports or interface cards on this physical machine and each one got four, that would give you 12 potential um, private IP addresses to work with. Although. I'm not 100% certain on that because I've never really gone and installed more than four virtual machine guests on any one machine. Um, nope. So the reason that I brought that up about the IP address is that this machine, Virtual Guest 1, um, for example, and I don't know this offhand, but it, let's say it gets 192.168.1.20. Now, if I set up SSH over that, I can now access that guest directly using that IP address rather than relying on this uh, console built into the vCenter, uh, I'm sorry, vSphere client. Uh, automatic upgrades. So I'll go ahead and just install OpenSSH and whatnot later as I decide I want it.
Okay, so the machine is shutting down. It just rebooted. And now I should be able to... <laughs> log right in. Um, obviously, don't ever use that as your password. It's probably the worst password you can ever have. But... Okay, so now we're into the system, and we can use it just like we would any other Linux machine if we were sitting directly in front of it, although now we're using it through the vSphere client's own um, terminal window here. So we could go ahead and install SSH. So let's do apt get install SSH. Let's go ahead and install that. see the IP address that was given to us again is on the same network 192.168.1 in this case it was given as 10 and now let me go to uh, that was not what I wanted way too late right now. Um, SSH config, so this should all be running. And let me just test this out. We're on 10. Uh, let me open up this and go to 192.168.1.10, port 22. Yeah, that's fine. And demo. So now I am logged in to this machine, not using the VMware vSphere client, but from Windows using PuTTY SSH client. So now at this point, I don't even need to worry about the VMware vSphere client anymore. I can just access this. And if I wanted to open up firewall rules and port forwarding, I could access this from a remote computer off my own network. Now, let me just exit that. In terms of actually accessing the vSphere client from a remote network, I really wouldn't recommend opening up firewall rules to directly allow you to do that. What I would actually recommend at that point is you either use something like team viewer to access another computer to access it or better yet create your own vpn and attach to your network over that vpn and then connect directly to the server using vSphere um, because you don't want somebody to be able to manipulate all of your server uh, instances in one go So let me just jump back here and we'll go over a few of the other things you can do. Events, uh, performance, you can see again how this particular guest is performing in contrast to this performance which shows how the overall system itself is performing. So you can break it down for each guest individually Um, change the way that all of this is reported back to you. So uh, at this point, everything's running the way you wanted. Now, if you wanted to go ahead and shut this down, the way that I would 
recommend doing that. First of all, go to the console for that guest and then shut it down the way you would normally. So a graceful shutdown, more or less. Now that's going to shut down Linux from within itself. That will disable or power off this guest. And now at this point, if you had to turn off this physical server machine, what you can do is right click on it. Um, best thing to do, especially, is to enter maintenance mode. Select yes. And now it's in maintenance mode. And now you can go ahead and right click again and shut it down. And at that point, it's going to pop up and ask you why. So let's say you were uh, upgrading hardware. You could just make note of that, and it will go in the events log for later on, and you can see exactly why the computer was shut down, by whom, and at what time it was shut down. This will help you for future reference if there was a problem. So if it was shut down without intention, you'd be able to hopefully decipher that because there would be no entry as to why it was shut down. Now to bring it back up, you could go ahead, um, you would actually have to physically push the button, and then once you're back up, you would go ahead and right click this and take it out of maintenance mode. So disable maintenance mode. Then you'd be able to come down here and right click and power this machine back up. And in a minute or two later, you could then go ahead and log back in over the terminal or over, again, PuTTY or some other client. So that pretty much covers the basics of using ESXi. We've installed a guest and an operating system to it. Okay, so vSphere is shut down because that computer is now turned off. So you could go ahead and repeat that same process again and add another version of Ubuntu server. You could add a desktop edition if you wanted to connect to. You could go ahead and add Windows desktop, Windows server all of those if you wanted and then you could pretty much leapfrog your way back and forth between all of those you could host uh, your website on one of those and maybe you want to host your database on a different one of those and point each of them to each other and you can start really messing around with different networking techniques and control all of it through this single vSphere client software in one shot. So hopefully that uh, covers all of the different things that we wanted to go over for you and I might do a follow-up to all of this at some point later on to show some of the more advanced things that we can do with this or if people have questions regarding certain aspects of it I can cover that. But that should pretty much cover the tutorial series here for all of these different things that we wanted to cover. So thanks for watching and you can check out some of the other channels.